Welcome everyone. We'll be waiting two to three minutes to get started as a courtesy for those who are still in the middle of connecting. Welcome folks, we're waiting till two to three minutes after to get started for those who are still in the middle of connecting. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us and thanks for being part of our community. My name is Ryan Heffernan and I'll be your host for today. A few reminders before we start the presentation. If you have issues viewing the stream at any time during the presentation please, and are using the web browser version of Teams, please refresh your browser. If you're using the desktop app of Teams, please exit and rejoin. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared publicly. We will post the recordings on our community at aka.ms slash security webinars. And all these links that I'm referencing here, I've pasted in the Q&A window, so you can check them out there. Closed captions are available during the live broadcast. You can enable them by clicking on the CC button located to the lower right hand corner of your screen. During this time, please feel free to ask questions by typing in the live, Q &A, Q, live event Q&A window by clicking on the ask a question button. Beware that any questions you post will be publicly visible. However, if you prefer, you can post your question anonym anonymously by checking the box right below where you enter it. We often get many questions on these webinars and we were, will do our best to respond to all of them in real time. If we missed your question or you have additional questions after the event, don't hesitate to raise them on our forum at aka.ms slash security community. If you're listening to this after the fact is a recording, that's also a great place to ask a question. While you're there, please join our community. That's the best way to ensure you don't miss any future webinars or major announcements. On our community, you can speak directly to our engineering teams that create our security products. You'll be able to influence our product designs and get early access to changes by doing things like joining our private preview program, requesting features, giving feedback, reviewing our product roadmaps, attending events, or joining webinars like this. We believe the best way to improve our products is by removing any barriers between you and the people that create them. So we hope you'll join us. In today's session, Andrew Bayes will guide you through securing yourself. Andrew has been working at Microsoft since 1999 in research, engineering, risk management, and during the last few years in cybersecurity operations. He's delivered this securing you talk to over 10,000 Microsoft employees in live security training and to many more as a recorded security training. And now he's excited to share that content with all of you. With that, I'll turn it over to him. Andrew, the floor is yours.
Oop, Andrew, just a heads up, you're still on mute. How about now? Now I can hear you. All right. All right. Thanks. Off we go. OK, thanks for the introduction, Ryan, uh, and the tip on how to use Teams effectively. <laughs> you'd think I'd have that down. All right, uh, as Ryan said, been at Microsoft a long time. I've uh, most recently been focusing on uh, cybersecurity, uh, engineering, and operations. It's been exciting. I've learned a lot, and I really enjoyed uh, sharing this content with Microsoft internally, and I'm uh, really excited to share it externally now. One of the things that happened internally is I, I would give this presentation to people who were familiar with some cybersecurity concepts. And uh, I put this slide in for that reason. If you are familiar with this stuff, uh, please, one, make sure, make sure you really are taking care of these things for yourself. Uh, make sure you're practicing the techniques I'm talking about in here and then use some of the ideas that I'm going to share here to help other people. So uh, even if you are familiar with this stuff, uh, pass it along to others. The, these techniques are, are supposed to be pretty easy to follow uh, uh, and really good for everyone. You don't have to be in engineering or in software to, to use these techniques. We'll start off by talking about the landscape so everyone has some context. Does anyone recognize this view? Give you a moment to guess. You're welcome to guess out loud. I won't be able to hear you, but it'll make it more fun. Uh, St. Louis, St. Louis Arch. Uh, anyone know the, the claim to fame of the city? I'll tell you, I can't hear your answers. Murder capital of the United States for a couple of years running uh, per FBI statistics. I'm not here to give St. Louis grief, but I want to ask the question, if you lived in the most dangerous part of St. Louis, the murder capital of the United States, would you lock your door? And of course you would. So let's talk about the internet because most people go on the internet all the time and it's a neighborhood of sorts because people go there to do banking and talk with friends and hang out and buy things and sell things. Uh, what do you, wh what's this neighborhood like? It's fraught with peril, let's put it that way. One of the things uh, I've done before is, in this engineering context, uh, set up a thing called a virtual machine. So set up a server on the internet and see what happens. And it takes about five minutes before I start seeing attempts to log in to my server that has never existed before from all over the world. So the, the quick version here, there are services and robots and scanners and tools and all manner of things that are constantly probing for anything on the internet and looking for vulnerabilities constantly. So in your neighborhood, it's like having robots running around scanning, looking for you. We have in our neighborhood on the internet, weapons of mass destruction. And what do I mean by that? We have very, very powerful hacking tools created by nation states, uh, uh, organized crime entities, um, amateurs, professionals of all kinds, and anyone can use these tools. Uh, there's a group called Script Kitties, and it just, it, it really just talks about uh, people with less formal education in hacking, so maybe they don't have the, the training and uh, a, a country might give their spy units, or they may not have the financial backing of organized crime uh, but they still have the tools and they can wreak havoc with these tools because they are available to the hackers. They're not hard to find. And then, of course, there's organized crime. Uh, you could say the mob, uh, but there's all manner of organized crime uh, taking advantage of vulnerabilities on the Internet, taking advantage of misconfigured routers and all kinds of interesting uh, technology issues to take money or get access to devices that let them get money. That, that's the real quick version. There are, there are other bad things too, but I just want to make sure you understand the internet isn't uh, a happy-go-lucky place. There is a fair amount of danger there if you don't take care of yourself. So 
neighborhood on the internet, it, it's not so great. It's, it's not a great neighborhood. It's a pretty dangerous one, but we can do something about it. Before we jump in to what we're gonna do, let's talk about table stakes. The things, I'm not gonna cover these in detail. These are things you should be doing already. For example, if you run Windows, install the updates. That's it. Uh, install the updates and patches when they come in. They, the, the patches and updates, they fix all kinds of things. They fix a wide variety of bugs for you know, whether it's printer drivers or uh, the, the, the list is endless because software is, is incredibly complicated and uh, everything is changing all the time. But the other important piece there is these patches contain security fixes that really matter. Uh, the security updates that go into the, the regular patches are very, very important. And that's why installing those patches is a big deal. Don't turn off your antivirus. Modern operating systems come with great antivirus products. If you go get a, if you go look up the, the best antivirus products from a reputable reviewer, uh, they'll show you the top 10. And every time um, the, the standard default antivirus products rate uh, well in the top 10, they go up and down and the other ones go up and down, but they're good. So just don't turn them off. Whole disk encryption. So in Windows, it's called BitLocker. Uh, I forget the other terms, but if you have the option to turn on whole disk encryption, it won't slow anything down. Uh, it may take a while to encrypt if you haven't done it yet, but if you start at the get-go and give it some time, once it's encrypted, it's fast. And that means if your device is lost or stolen, uh, no one can get access to that hard drive. The data is safe. That's a big deal. Speaking of your data being safe, if you have some data you really care about, if you're writing a novel and, and you're just about done and you have it saved on one thumb drive, consider backing it up. That may be a silly example, but there are a lot of things you may want to back up. Digital copies of important records, family photos, uh, a list of uh, important uh, insurance account numbers or bank accounts, these kinds of things. And lastly, uh, change default passwords. Anytime you're ever given a default password, you really need to change it. So these are the table stakes. These are things everyone should be doing all the time. We'll talk about more fun and interesting things starting now. Let's talk about how they get your stuff, how the bad actors end up with your account information. There are two main ways. One, you give it to them. Two, someone else gives it to them. What are you talking about, Andrew? I don't give that stuff away, and who, who do I know who's giving that away? Let's talk. The best way of all for a bad actor to get your data is you hand it over, and you guessed it, phishing. And this is a great example. I love this cartoon, and it shows why phishing works. Now, what's missing in this cartoon is the, the little squares the, the 50 or 100 or 1,000 little squares before you get to Dilbert where the same thing happens. Scam, 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 delete, 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 goes into junk mail, never see it, goes into junk mail, never see it. And eventually one person, it gets through and he says, sure, I'll enter my account number. So yes, the phishing mail will say, please enter your account number. Uh, if you're having a hard time seeing the screen, I'm, I'm reading it a little bit here. And eventually you know, one person does. And if your job as a, a person running phishing and conducting a scam is to get some people to respond it doesn't cost you cost you much more to send it to a million people and if you still get five good responses and you can use them hey you win uh, so the goal here when you see something that says enter your account number remember the pointy haired boss don't say okie dokie here's another great example here's dogbert i send these fake banking emails to global executives uh, I get their financial information and I steal their money. And the great thing about this cartoon, if you look at if you look at the words, dear customer, this is your bank. We forgot your social security number and password. You should send those to us so we can protect you. Sincerely, IB Banker. And what I love about this is that is the format for many phishing emails. It sounds almost just like that. <laughs> it's, it's often very, very close to that. So once again, he says looks legit. Any guesses as to what he says next? Okie dokie, typey type, type, type. 
here's all my information. So it's a little bit poking fun uh, at phishing, and we'll talk about uh, phishing in more detail here, uh, but that's the essence of it. Someone asks uh, and someone gives it up. The next best way for the bad guys to get your data is the companies you trust your data with, give it up. And here are some examples of breaches in the last few years. And I stopped adding things on here because I wouldn't have room. All these icons would be super small and the numbers wouldn't be uh, readable. But these are fascinating. And you'll see, for example, uh, Facebook, 50 million, LinkedIn, 170 million, Equifax. I believe this number got a lot bigger. Equifax, what's scary here is the data that got given to or that was stolen by the attackers. This data, in the case of Equifax, includes your name, your social security number, your date of birth, all your previous addresses, all your credit card information, people you uh, may have lived with, their phone numbers, your email addresses, all the things, and your credit rating, right? And so on and on. If you look in the lower right, Office of Personnel Management, 21 million 500, well, that doesn't sound like a big breach, only 21 million on this page, that's hardly anything. That was a breach of this agency that runs, it, it, uh, it runs background checks for security clearances for the US government. So information on 21 million people with security clearances, including very sensitive top secret clearances and data that includes, for example, uh, psychological evaluation. That was all stolen. Biometric information, on and on and on. Very scary, very sensitive data, all kinds of data out there. And I had to add a few other things because that was a fun slide and it had lots of pretty pictures. And I looked some more uh, because I, you know, I've done this this talk over a few years and I said, well, I want to add something recently. Like, okay, geez. I found all of these things. Oh, it's core 200 million, 380,000 here. Hey, and then there's these cool collections where uh, now the hackers are just bundling together all of these uh, recent or the previous breaches and, and sometimes posting them publicly and sometimes selling them. Here's a collection for 772 e million email addresses and 21 million also have passwords. And here's another collection of 25 billion records. Email and password pairs, 2.7 billion. Uh, and that went up 500 million uh, in a year. <laughs> and, but there's some good news, and I'm, this is a little tongue in cheek, I will confess. It only takes 191 days, I think this, this is 20, 2019 or 2020, to detect a breach. Yeah, that's right, average 191 days to detect a breach. That's how long the data is exposed before anybody knows. And that's from 201 days in 2016. So the, the number's going down very slowly. Yeah, like I said, tongue in cheek. Uh, it's pretty scary. And in the in the security industry, there's this uh, Verizon data breach investigations report comes out every year. Uh, everyone waits for it. It's very exciting because it, it provides really interesting, important trend data. And in one of these recent ones, they only talk about the most interesting 2200 confirmed breaches. There are many, many more. So <laughs> like I said, your data has been shared. When you trust organizations with it, it, it has been leaked. It will be leaked. They're not doing it maliciously. It's hard to secure things. That is just the world we live in right now. But there are things you can do to protect yourself. Uh, th this and this was a fun one. This was the, the sketchiest one of all. I found this in July of this year. Um, as you can see, they, they, the researchers found this, this nifty 15 billion logins collection. And this was the, the one I liked the best. Five billion of them are, were unique. Uh, they include username and password, and there are uh, no repeated pairs. So that, it's a very high quality set of usernames, passwords, five billion of them ready to go, ready for uh, bad actors to use. So what do they do? If I'm a hacker and I have 5 billion records, usernames and passwords, what do I want to do? 
one of the things, one of the many things is find one that works. So if I want to go after after uh, Andrew Bayes, uh, I would go, for example, to Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Good luck. Don't try that one. Uh, let's say, nah. I'll just I'll just stop talking about this part. Uh, find an account that works. Find a username and password that works and get in. And it may not be an, an account that really matters. Maybe it's an email account I never use. There's nothing interesting in there. But once the hacker realizes that username and password works, then the idea is now let's go to Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and a different email account and a different email account. And the big list of accounts I see in my big set of stolen data that, that Andrew Bayes may have. And I'm going to try that same username and password for all of the accounts. And when people reuse that same username and password, this works great. Now what you can do is start looking for ways to take over identities, uh, transfer money, um, compromise other people, et cetera, et cetera. That's called credential stuffing. And that is one of the consequences of, of reusing uh, the same password across multiple accounts. We'll talk about not doing that. And now that I've given you all kinds of sad and frustrating things to think about, let's let's talk about some tools and what you can do. Let's talk about phishing for starters. We'll do a really quick review here. I hope you've seen uh, some guidance on what to do or how to avoid phishing uh, in the past. Uh, and we'll, we'll cover that really quickly right here. If something says do it right now, you have to do this thing right now in email. That's usually that's usually a good sign of phishing. Um, uh, one of the ones I like is we've turned off your bank account. You know, pick any credit card company. They'll always say uh, Chase and Citibank and you know, pick any popular company and they'll put that in the title and say we've turned off your account. And uh, on one hand, you can ask, well, how do they know if I have a Chase account? And the answer is they don't need to know if you have a Chase account because they'll send it to 5 million people and some of them will for sure. And they'll say, oh my gosh, someone knows I have a Chase account. It's, it's clearly from Chase. Uh, they've turned off my account. Oh no, what do I do? I need to go enter my account information right now and turn it back on. That was someone saying, by the way, uh, that, you know, that was the pointy haired boss saying, okie dokie, I'll enter all my data. So if someone, if you get one like that, it's very urgent. That's a good sign it's phishing. Misspellings, it, it, that's a good indicator as well. Bad grammar and bad spelling. You should not rely on that. If you see an email that's well written as uh, phishing uh, and, and fishers and hacker, hackers will do, they're going to get better. They're going to start using spell checker. They're, they'll find more people who are good at English uh, to make sure they look right. So while that makes it easier to find the bad ones, if you don't see misspellings, you still can't assume it is safe. This one is pretty easy, the bogus sender. Uh, depending on what kind of email client you use, uh, it may display the actual sender, but you can put any name you want uh, as your, as your, your email uh, address. Uh, it, it's like a label. It's like putting a sign on your house. Your, your house is still going to have an address. Your apartment may still have an address, but you can put a sign on there that says uh, the White House. Uh, you, you, you could put McDonald's you know, on your on your wall. It, it really doesn't matter. But your address is going to be the same and the email address that, you know, what you send your email from. That's still going to be an email address that's real and you can either hover over the label that says uh, your favorite bank and see where it's really sent from. Or depending on your, your email client, it'll expand that out for you. And when you see they're not the same, that's how you know it's a good sign that it's phishing. Links. One of the, I mean, there's, two, there's two main mechanisms that the bad actors will use to uh, cause bad things to happen in phishing. One is they'll send a link that takes you to a bad place where uh, ideally, you will either enter your information that you shouldn't, including like your username and password, then they'll just take it and go do bad things, or you'll click something and download uh, a malicious file and run it on your computer. That's that's the first way via a link. The second way is 
they'll attach a file of some kind and give you instructions on how to open it and just run the, the bad file right there on your machine. But it's usually easier to send you to a place uh, outside of your email client uh, to go do the download of the bad file or enter your, your private data. And how do you know it's a bad link? Just hover over it. If you hover over the link, you'll see where it really goes and then you'll know not to click it. We talked about the unexpected attachment uh, uh, briefly. Just know that when you get one of these unexpected attachments in a phishing email, there, there are a few common ways. One, one would be, for example, a zip file, and they give you instructions on how to unzip the file, and that unzipped file is an executable file that runs on your machine and takes it over and does things like capturing passwords, you know, looking for banking data, uh, running things in the background, turning your machine into a, a bot, so to speak, so it can be used to attack other machines later, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another common way uh, the bad guys will include attachment is a an office document, Excel, Word, PowerPoint. And what they've done with those documents is they've included code called uh, a macro. And the macro is something you have to enable before it can run. But once you enable it, it's like running a, a code or a program within uh, that program itself that can do malicious things. So if you get an unexpected attachment or if you get an office attachment that says, hey, you know, click here to, to, you have to click this special thing to go to the next step to run the thing. Don't do that. Don't run the macro. And of course, if your bank is asking you for your username and password in email, uh, if they're asking you for your social security number, if anyone is asking you for your login data in an email, uh, that is likely phishing. Now, let's say you really have a legitimate email from your your email account provider or uh, or your bank or a social media account you use. If you if you actually think there's something you need to do, if there's something you need to fix, just close the email, open your browser and type you know myemail.com or facebook.com and log in normally there to see if the problem actually exists and solve it that way versus clicking the suspicious phishing email. And the last one, and this is the most important one. If you get an email that just doesn't feel right, if your gut says something is going on, you don't need to know what specifically the issue is. Just don't click the link and don't open the attachment and you're good to go. There are lots of things that will cause red flags. You may forget number five on the list of bullets I just gave you, but something in your head is going to say that's not quite right. Then you know. Don't click, don't open, you're good. We're going to have a quiz. And unfortunately, I can't see a uh, video of you. <laughs> uh, and I'm not I don't have an easy way to capture how many hands are raised, but this is how the quiz is going to work. I'll give you a few seconds, maybe 10 or 15 seconds. It hasn't started yet, and I'm going to ask you to hold up a count of how many things you see that are indicated indicators of phishing in this email. You have 15 seconds. Go. All right, time's up. Let's see that that show of fingers. How many? All right. First of all, let me just say this. If the if the number is is one or more, you win. <laughs> because that means you're not going to go click that link and you're not going to go enter your banking information. So let's walk through all the things that are wacky about this email. Number one at the top from top to bottom. Bank of America. Ban at ntlove.net. Those are not the same. So this is a great example of the email address doesn't match this, this name, and that's a clear sign. The bank, your bank account has been suspended. Banks usually don't you know, reach out for the first time in email saying we've turned all your things off. That just does not make sense, but it is exciting and scary. So that sign of urgency, yeah, sign of phishing. This used to be a thing. This third thing, this green bar, 
And then it stopped being a thing. I won't speculate as to why, but it certainly was easy to fake. So something that says, <laughs> you can trust me, it really means nothing here. It is entertaining though. Uh, I left it in there even though it isn't as common anymore because I found it so incredibly amusing. Exclusively for this up and down line is called a pipe symbol. Well, that's not you. That's not anybody. Nobody is named pipe symbol. I'll call that a, a grammar error. Uh, online, yeah, actually I should highlight this one too. Looked up, maybe it means look up. I don't know, it's kind of weird. If you go down here, your details, misspelling have been changed or incomplete, broken grammar. Therefore, verify your details to regain access to online service. One, it sounds weird. Uh, two, there's no period. If you skip down a little further, best regards with no comma, internet support team. I have so many phishing emails that come from internet support team. <laughs> it sounds cool and official. It also means nothing. Uh, and one more thing, if you hover, oh, I'm sorry, you can't see it. Nuts. Uh, down here on the bottom, it got cut off. Well, maybe you can see. No, you can. You can. I just can't see it on my screen. You'll see, so if I hover over this link here, if you can see my, my uh, cursor, this secure.bankofamerica.com uh, alleged link, you'll see in the lower left, it, it, it uh, shows sumix.org. Well, that's clearly not bankofamerica.com. And in that case, it was a website that was taken over by a hacker. And they just put up a fake, a fake Bank of America login webpage. And this happens thousands of times a day. Every time someone misconfigures their website or they, I, I could go on for days about this one, uh, hackers will take it over and then they'll just put up a, a fake landing page for you know, anything that requires a login and send out phishing mail and send people to that and uh, use it to capture data. So again, if you didn't click anything, you got an A. Good job. All right, here's the to don't list. It's very easy. Don't open attachments. You can hover over a link if you want. Just don't click it. Don't go to that page. There's a there's a variation here. Uh, Bitly, ow, ow.ly, owly, uh, goo.gl, Google. Back when Twitter didn't allow as much uh, as many characters in their tweets, uh, long uh, URLs, long uh, web addresses, would you get shortened using this Bitly service, which was also good for obfuscating, for hiding the real destination. Uh, so if you see something that's shortened using one of these services, yeah, don't click on that either. You can't actually see where it goes when you hover over it. You should just assume it goes to a place you don't want to be. And we have some to-dos as well. You can expand that sender info if it's not already expanded and be amused at the crazy email address that looks nothing like where you're supposed to go. This one's tricky. There are sometimes vulnerabilities in uh, how email is processed. And this happens all the time with everything. New ways to break things are discovered constantly. That, that's the nature of vulnerabilities that get exploited, they get patched and fixed, and then it's, it's a constant cycle. That's the nature of the internet. Uh, things break and get fixed all the time. So what can you do if that happens? If you get an email and you expand it, and it really does come from your family member, but it contains a wacky uh, attachment that you don't expect. It contains a link. When you hover over it, it sends you to Ben at NT Love you know, or, or you know, sumix.org, even though it says Bank of America or your, your or Facebook. We also have situations where hacking tools and software and, and systems will compromise someone's email and then use that email account to send malicious attachments to everyone in their contact list. So now you have a legitimate email account sending out bad things. Well, you still have the option of saying, hey, mom. Um, I would call my mom. Hey, mom, did you really intend to send me this you know, Word doc that has a macro in it, that seems strange. And mom will say, that's not me. People keep sending me things about they're getting hacked and it's my fault. <laughs> so that didn't happen with my mom, by the way. I'm not here to disparage my mother. However, it may happen that you get a legitimate, you get an email from a legitimate account that contains bad things. 
Uh, you have all of these other indicators you can pay attention to to still not click the link and not open the attachment. You can still make a phone call. You can still send someone a, a text message or an email on a separate account and say, hey, what's going on here? This is suspicious. So you still have tools you can use. Let's talk about, OK, so you've protected yourself. You're not going to give your stuff away willingly now. But if you remember, lots of other trusted entities have given away billions of accounts and will give away more. What can you do? Let's start with a question. Does unlocking your door make you angry? I'm going to lead you down a little path here. Do, do you go home? Uh, let's say you, you've gone to work pre-COVID and uh, you, you come back home and you unlock your door. You take your keys out. You say, oh, I hate these keys. Stupid key. And you go to your door and, oh, I hate this lock. Stupid lock. And open the door. Oh, I got a deadbolt too. This is so ridiculous. And you undo that. And you go in and you shut the door and maybe you lock it and you hang up your keys. Oh, I got to hang up my keys. And then when you leave in the morning, where are my keys? I can't find my keys. And you go to your car. Ah, oh, stupid car. Unlock the car. Hate this lock and these keys. You don't. You don't. You just, you're not, you, you're not worried about that. Uh, you don't care. It's normal for you. It's normal for most people to not worry, to not have a problem using locks on doors. This, this lock is called a security control in the, in the security industry, uh, which makes it sound even less fun or less normal. It makes it sound like a hassle. It's a security control. Remember your neighborhood. Remember that picture I showed you of the world with all the bad stuff in it, in the internet. Uh, you do need to lock doors. You do need to lock accounts. Uh, how do you do that? How do you lock up your stuff in cyberspace? In that crazy rotten neighborhood, using the same username everywhere, if you have the option to use a different one, that's not gonna make any difference. How about if you use a simple password everywhere? Well, yeah, I think I remember Andrew saying something about this thing had 25 billion passwords and this one had 15 billion. So if it's simple, no. How about a strong password and you reuse it everywhere? Well, you also may remember <laughs> those passwords getting reused across all the accounts when someone gives your strong password away. So that's not gonna work. There's a really cool website, Have I Been Pwned? Uh, a couple things to know there. One, it's interesting, trustworthy. All you need to do is put in an email address that you've used as a login before. So you've used it as a username because a lot of websites will say, enter your, use, your email address as your username. So if you go here, enter an email address, it'll show you, hey, here are all of the public breaches where your email address was exposed. It's pretty cool. And if you wanna say, uh, sign me up, it doesn't cost anything. They'll just say, the next time there's a breach where we see this email address, we'll send you an email address and let you know. Pretty slick. They don't ask you for passwords. There's nothing to give away here. Uh, and, and I did this. And by the way, if, if you go there right now, it'll be a different list of things on the website. But as you can see, oh, here's top 10 breaches. It's from several years ago. Uh, lots and lots and lots of accounts. A couple of things to keep in mind here. These are only the breaches that get exposed to everybody. What you're not going to see in the lists captured here are, for example, that Office of Personnel Management bunch of people or uh, Equifax. Why? The hackers make money selling Equifax accounts, selling uh, user accounts that have been stolen. The I'll just say the the probable nation state attacker who stole all of the US clearance information, they're not gonna benefit by making that public. They're gonna use it to their own ends. So lots of stolen breach data remains in the hands of the attackers and is not for sale. This database shows the data that has been made public. They just dump it out for the whole public to see, or they put it on their hacker forums and share it amongst themselves, uh, but it's, it is available. So I signed up back early in 2017, and then I got my first one. I was so excited. Hey, look, uh, I'm in a breach. <laughs> uh, have I been pwned works? And what was it? Uh, it was just a spam list. Okay, fine, I'm in a spam list. That doesn't surprise me one bit. 
And I removed my my, my two line, but it was two uh, Andrew Bayes at blah, blah, blah. And then I got another one later. Oh, look at that. Kickstarter gave away all their data, including mine. That's a bummer. Oh. And then later the next year, oh, look at this. What did I get here? Uh, Apollo data breach. Don't know what that is, but that's a lot of records. Oh, look at this. Another data breach. That's a lot of records. And then I got another one in December. What was that? You've been scraped data, necklace combo list share. Uh, there have actually, you know what? There was a few other ones I didn't capture here as well. Um, a, one of those big, huge collections of billions of things that I told you about. I'm in one of those. Odds are good you are too. Something else from some other customer. Uh, one thing I want to call it with these, and th there were some other ones I didn't put in here too. Uh, there, there will be, there was another one, actually one of the other ones, it said, instead of, as, as in this example, so I got the mail in November of 2019. The breach happened in October of 2019. Well, that's pretty quick. That's way quicker than that 190 days. Uh, one I got more recently in, in uh, 2019, no, it was in 2020, said, yeah, this breach actually took place in 2016, and we just found out about it. So that data had been out there for four years, uh, and nobody knew except for the, the hackers who had been using that data. So what do you do? Uh, imagine you're in that neighborhood, and your house key got taken and shared and reproduced, and it's you know put in different mailboxes, and it's thrown around in the street, and it's put you know, handed off to robots, and and script kitties and whatnot. So you know your data has likely been involved in a breach. It's a great idea to go get a feel for how many with haveiveinpwned.com. And here's the important part. For whatever accounts show up there, or for any account you've reused your password, or for any account you've used a short, like less than 10 character password, update and change the password. If you can create a unique username each time, do that too. Obviously, create that new, new password. Very important. And you can also look at the passwords you never use anymore. Another, another amusing trick. You can say, I used to use this password because I thought it was good. I'm going to check it out at Have I Been Pwned and see how many breaches it shows up in. Now, don't reuse that password ever, but it's a fun experiment. And again, once you change that, once you realize you've been in a breach, and you should assume you have, really change the password. It's amazing. Earlier this year, the, the, the study, uh, Carnegie Mellon, a third of users, after a breach announcement, a third of them change the password, and two thirds don't. Your username and your password is available. It's out there. It can certainly be used. You have to assume it's going to be used and it's going to cause you a lot of trouble. Of the third of the small amount who change the passwords, a third change it to a stronger password. So some people use a very similar or lousy, another lousy password. And if you look at the last bullet, or they'll take their password that is autumn 2019 and they'll change it to autumn 2020. A hacker does not have to be very smart to see that if the last four characters are a year, that they can just try a different year and probably get into your account. Food for thought. So now let's talk about how to secure every one of your accounts. We know what not to do. These are some great examples. The one on the lower right, Seahawks 2016. Pick your favorite sports team and put in a year. One of the easiest solutions to try for passwords. Uh, password one, password with dollar signs instead of S's. That is not clever. <laughs> it's actually not. It's super common. Uh, fall 2018 is a good one. And I put the lower left one, this ABCDFG you know, one exclamation point. I put that in there because it represents Ah, the guidance for a strong, strong password. You're going to have a capital letter and some lowercase letters, and you're going to have this many characters, and you're going to have a number and a special character. And what happens invariably? People use that exact order for that required amount of 
of characters, uh, and they'll use a one and exclamation point. Or maybe they'll get clever and use a two and an at sign, or a, a seven and an and character. Uh, these are typically very, very easy to crack and frequently reused. So now you know what not to use. This list, uh, this, this is not a particularly, it, it's not a sorted list of the most popular, but you can find them every year. Someone comes up, you know, actually way more often than every year, someone comes up with another list of the most popular passwords. Um, this list is 14.3 million long. It's a 14 million list uh, word password list that's commonly used by hackers that you could go grab right now. Just an example. I'm going to have to move quickly. I've got so much stuff to cover in this short amount of time. Why do we have these password guidelines? Uh, this guy named Bill Burr, great guy, back a long time ago, came up with these guidelines and it was the best we could come up with at, at the time. But there are new guidelines. And those are, uh, yeah, that was in 2003. The new guidelines from NIST, this uh, National Institute of Science uh, uh, Standards and Technology, the new recommendation is use a passphrase and uh, change it after a breach. So what is a passphrase? It's, a, it's way better than a password. So don't sweat the details of this slide. The, the quick version, if you look at the first one, hey, that looks like a great complicated password. Well, if you're cracking passwords as a hacker, it's easy. It's easy to crack. But if you go to the third uh, little pane here, it's actually hard for you to remember. So it's easy for the hackers to crack and hard for you to remember. What a drag. However, if you say instead, oh, my passphrase is going to be correct horse battery stable. That's you can remember that. And it's really, really hard to crack. Now, if you go to have I been pwned.com and you go to the password thing and then a cracked horse battery staple, you will see people are using this as their passphrase. Don't do that. But the idea is a great one. Use a few words, string them together, make them as random as you can. You can still remember them. It'll be very hard to crack. But we have another problem because I'm telling you, use a different password, use a different passphrase for every account. How could you possibly memorize a hundred different passphrases? You don't have to use a password manager. These are examples here. Uh, some very, very popular ones. Some of the most popular LastPass, Dashlane, one password. These are very effective tools that allow you to remember one passphrase. It opens up your password manager and that password manager will go ahead and enter passwords into whatever you need to log into. Very safe. They're designed to be incredibly secure then you only have to remember one password. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these. Uh, however, if you see something in the news, oh my gosh, password managers, huge, incredible bugs found, doom, you know, the world is falling apart, severe vulnerabilities. That does happen from time to time. Why? Because they're software and sometimes they have flaws and sometimes they break. But one thing to keep in mind, the companies who make these password managers, these tools are the reason for their existence and they care a lot about making them secure because if they're not, they don't have a business anymore. They have a vested interest in fixing them very quickly and making them very secure. In some of the very scary news not too long ago, oh no, last pass, severe vulnerabilities. But guess what? If you look at the rest of the news you know, toward the bottom of the article, after all the fear mongering takes place, yeah, this was in this old application that has less than 0.2% of usage and it's already been patched and fixed and it is certainly a better option to use these tools than to not use these tools. When you're talking about managing risk, that's a big deal. Uh, every piece of software has bugs and they get fixed and that's the part you care about. Do they get fixed? At the end of even the when we come across these fear mongering articles, the more responsible ones usually conclude with, yeah, you actually still should be using password managers and you're way better off. I get the question, but what about putting all my eggs in one basket? If someone gets access to my computer and they're able to log in and they know my one password, then they get all of my accounts. Well, no, you don't have to do it that way. You can still memorize a passphrase for your password manager for a whole bunch of accounts. 
And then you can remember, remember the passphrase for your bank account or your retirement account. And you can remember the one other passphrase for another special account. You could write down a passphrase and put it in a safe for a special account. You don't have to put everything in there, but it certainly does make it easy. And it is way better than using the same password everywhere or using uh, a series you can remember that would be easy to reproduce if a, a hacker got five or six of your accounts and knows the passwords were all the same. You don't have to put every, everything in there and you can still write stuff down and put it in a safe. It's just less convenient, which means you're less likely to do it. In the password manager, you can put in a huge, long, crazy password that you will never know, you will never remember, and you don't need to remember it. I don't know what most of my passwords are, and that's fine. They're huge, they're complicated. I never type them. The password manager does it for me. Fine with me. What else can you do? Lie. Systematic lying. There's a great article about this. Uh, whenever they want to know all of your other information to open an account, put in any name you want. I open a new account, I can put in. Uh, I'm going to say my name is Janet Smith. No offense to Janet Smith, it's just a name I grabbed. I'm going to say my, my username is Troubled Time Remoto 83. Just random gibberish because, again, I'm never going to enter it. The password manager will stick that stuff in there. If they're not mailing something to that person's name, they don't need to know my personal information. I'll give them a different set of information every time. Here's an example of a good strong password that I don't use. Uh, no one should use because now it's out there. My first car, Kung Pao Chicken. Every time my first car is different. High school mascot, you know, is long. Just pick something that isn't a mascot or put the number 43. <laughs> uh, so this systematic lying is a good thing because now when the hackers capture all of your data, they're not capturing accurate personal data that you can go use to answer your secret questions uh, for other accounts. So all these secret questions make the answers different every time. Browser password managers, I've had this question a lot. What about the one in Chrome or the one in Edge or the one in Firefox? While they're generally pretty secure, they are not nearly as useful because they only work in that browser. They probably won't work on your phone, depending on what kind of tools you're using, uh, and they have far fewer features. Uh, the password managers I'm recommending, and by the way, you'll get links to these. Uh, we'll, we'll post links in the in this session so you can have that data for yourself. Uh, and again, we'll we'll be uh, recording this thing. Um, those password managers have a, an immense amount of very convenient features, and they'll work across all the browsers, and they'll work on your phone, and they'll sync between computer A and computer B and and your phone. Uh, it, it's very convenient, and they do it securely. They, they can do it securely. Uh, the password manager will allow you to share between family members. If you choose to share one password among different people in your family, you can just choose to, sh to share that. You can have an emergency backup. If I got hit by a bus, I can have this person who does have access to my account after whatever amount of time uh, to go you know, help things not be a problem. And you can store a passport picture or other secure documents in these password managers. I don't have time to go through these demos right now. They're really slick. Uh, uh, I'll include these links so that you can check them out on your own and sh they'll show you how incredibly convenient these tools are. One other thing. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication. The username and the password, even if you have a long complicated password, as we've demonstrated, it will get leaked. And what do you do? Once you find out, you change it to a different long and complicated password. But for whatever amount of time before you find out about the leak, it's out there. So what do you do? This cool technique, two-factor, multi-factor authentication. A factor, a thing you know, a thing you have, or a thing you are. It's the other thing in addition to the password that you need to unlock your account. You may have seen some of these before. They're very easy to use. Remember when I talked about getting angry when you go home? It's like having a deadbolt for free. So while someone may have given away your house key all over that crazy neighborhood with the robots and the script kitties and the, and the organized crime, you are the only one with the key to the deadbolt. That's what this means. So a thing you know, it could be a PIN, your personal identification number. It could be a separate password that's only in your head. Um, a thing you have, it could be the special security chip in your phone. 
It could be a hardware-based token. You have to put in a USB slot before you can do a thing, or you have to hold near your phone so it can communicate in your radio waves to do a thing. Uh, a thing you are. Well, a lot of people open their phone with a face scan or a thumbprint. Those are biometrics. Those are things you are. So these other factors, the second key to get into your accounts, and you should enable this anywhere you can, uh, they have very common apps, the Microsoft Authenticator, the Google Authenticator. Uh, this one on the lower left, Twilio Authy, is one of the very best, most highly rated authenticators out there. This one on the upper right, this USB uh, goofy looking thing, uh, Yubico YubiKey, one of the very best hardware authenticators out there. It's very easy to use. Um, it, it's less convenient than just remembering a simple pin, but if someone wants to access your account, unless they obtain that physical device from you, they cannot do it. That is cool. With the other uh, phone-based authenticators, you have to have your phone, and the authenticator app is linked just to that phone. And you have to open your phone with a factor, which is the biometrics, usually, or a PIN, something you know. And then you have to click on that app and approve after trying to log into account. It is a great way to secure your accounts. And all of these things I just mentioned here, they are way better than just getting a code over text message. Why? Because the system that, that, that was designed for sending these text messages, it's called SS7. It was designed and set up in 1975. And then it was enhanced in 1981. So it's almost 40 years old and it gets hacked all the time. And I show you some examples here of uh, when people set that up as their second factor for banking, it did not protect them. And while it's better than nothing, you are way better off with the other authenticator apps I mentioned earlier. So if this is all you can have as a second factor for that two-factor or multi-factor authentication, so 2FA, two-factor authentication, MFA, multi-factor authentication, if the text message is all you can do, great. That's If that's all the only option, take it. If you can get a phone call, that's actually more secure because there's a sound connection that has to take place. Intercepting that is a little bit harder. But the best options of all are those phone apps uh, and the hardware tokens I mentioned. All right, I know we're coming up on time here. This may have sounded like a lot of doom and gloom, uh, but believe it or not, these, these tools I've given you, they are very easy to use, and they will really, really secure you and make it a lot harder uh, to get hacked. A quick review. Don't forget the table stakes. Just don't turn off your antivirus. Install all your updates. With phishing, don't click the links. Don't open attachments. Remember your gut. Something doesn't feel right, just don't touch it. See what accounts are already exposed. Bullet number three. Check on have I been pwned. But again, assume there are many other accounts that have been exposed and you just don't know it yet. Uh, and for any of those where you reuse a password, uh, update it. If it's short and weak, if it's less than 10 characters, go make a better one. And you, with your password manager, it'll generate them for you if you want. If a big, long, great, complicated password, you never even need to know what it is. Use a password manager, use fake secret, quote unquote secret answers because they're certainly not secret. And then of course, two-factor, and multi-factor authentication. Use one of those apps. They're easy to set up. Most accounts allow you to do that. Just go into the security settings and say, turn on the extra security. It'll say, you know, pick your app. And when you have the app, you know, just scan this QR code or do something else simple and Shazam, you have it enabled. Whew. All right. You may not have wanted to hear some of these things. Uh, that's the red pill using the matrix reference. Uh, I didn't really give you a choice here, sorry. Uh, you know it's unsafe, but you have the tools to secure yourself. And since this is recorded, you can share these tools with friends and family. Uh, there is, uh, we have these references. You don't need to write them all down here. We'll make sure they're, they're posted in the chat. Uh, we'll have other reference documentation we can get you as well. Um, I'll make sure to get those uh, example, uh, those video links uh, put out there as well. Uh, one more thing, when it comes to friends and family, when it comes to reviewing what I covered today, this, and we'll post this link as well, is a great resource. It's a super simple way 
to uh, walk through uh, just a couple uh, of pages of text, answer a few questions, and review all of this content in this nifty uh, training program we put together on the Microsoft Docs. And of course, uh, I'd love your feedback. Uh, why? When we do this again, we'll try and make it better. One of those pieces of feedback will be, we need more time for Q&A. Absolutely. <laughs> I got it. Uh, and ready for questions now, to whatever extent we have time to do them. Thank you for uh, listening. I hope you learned some good stuff. Uh, can't wait to hear the feedback and questions now. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Do you mind if we run over a little bit with questions here? Have you got time for that? I am just fine with that. OK, great. Um, so one of them I've got here is uh, when you were mentioning the table stakes, um, someone was asking if you'd put in the Windows firewall at number six. They say customers seem to almost universally disable it. Can you talk about the importance of Windows Firewall? That, you know, that's a great question. I, I, I can only go with my personal experience here. Uh, while we deal with all kinds of firewalls in corporate environments, uh, personally, I've never had a need to modify my firewall settings other than when there's a request to enable a certain application to communicate differently. So when I install a new app, he says, hey, we need to modify the firewall settings for this to work. I say, sure, go ahead. Uh, and that's that's all the experience I've had. Uh, the only trouble I've had with firewall settings is when I've installed another application, another um, another firewall on top of the, the existing Windows firewall or a suite of uh, antivirus tools and products on top of Windows. Then it has gotten really complicated for me. But when I just left it standard, regular, uh, uh, you know, Windows, Microsoft Defender, the antivirus and anti-malware solution, and the standard firewall settings, I've now actually never had a problem with it. So I'm sorry I don't have better data there, but that's the experience I have so far. Great, thank you. Another question here. There are two schools of thought regarding local administrator access. With the massive shift to working remotely, what's your opinion and has it changed? <laughs> That's a great question. For those who don't know, uh, well, there are lots of challenges with providing different types of access to business computers, whether in the workplace or at home. Some companies give their, their users administrative access, meaning on that work machine, they can install anything they want. They can install, they can go down, download any program they want. And there may be a list, a deny list that says you can't install these known really bad programs, but anything else is okay. Which means as soon as some new program that's really bad comes out uh, and it's not on that list yet, it can be installed and all kinds of, of havoc can ensue. Other companies will say, you have very limited rights. You can install nothing other than the software you give you. We give you, and it, honestly, it just depends on what do you do for that company. If your job is to develop software, well, shoot, you're going to have to have a lot of access to that machine to install things and create things and install the thing you created. Uh, if you're working in technology, uh, there's often a lot of access granted. Of course, it is far safer to not allow access to the machine other than a, a limited set of software on a restricted access account that is only for business purposes. Meaning you may not even be able to access you know, websites other than the corporate websites, or you may not be able to access the internet without going through a special service called a VPN, virtual private network, that connects back to the company. It really varies on a company by company basis, and at times it can be very inconvenient and that is sometimes the, the price of good security. Good security is often very inconvenient and it's hard to balance between convenience for the employees and security for the business. It's kind of a roundabout answer, uh, but those are my thoughts on it. It's a tough, a tough line to walk. Great, thank you. All right, this is in reference to um, when you were talking earlier about the breaches. The question was, aren't these logon attempts from hackers fully automatic these days? Um, I don't think that someone is actually actually manually going from one site to another to get the information. Good question. Absolutely, there are many, many automated attempts to log into things. 
There are tools that will allow you to input. Here's my config file. It has one billion of these things I just got from my cool dark website. I'm going to jam the username and password things in here. It's got an associated uh, you know, login page and I'm going to hit go. And I'm going to come back in you know, a day and see how many worked. And that's my list of compromised accounts that I can go play with after that. That's one way to do it. So that's more of a, a, a broad blast attack. A, however, you, there can be a targeted attack. Uh, depending on who you are and what the attacker wants and what list you ended up on, there are certainly more time consuming and uh, effective attacks an attacker can use. If someone, for example, has gone and bought an Equifax account, hey, you know what? If, you're, if, you're, if your credit rating is lousy, ah, fine. I'll go get yours and five others for, for 10 bucks on the dark web. Uh, that's the going rate for for a you know an Equifax account. But if you have really good credit, well, shoot, I'm, maybe I'll spend 25 bucks to get all of your personal information. Well, once I spent that 25 bucks and I'm a bad guy, I'm going to pay a lot of attention to that identity. And I'm going to think about, hmm, let me cross reference these passwords I have and this name and this personal data with this other list of the 15 billion and the 10 billion and the 8 billion and come up with my best guess for these passwords. And I'm going to get smart. I'm going to go into this account, try this and this account. Try this. That's a very manual process. So it really depends on uh, what the bad actor is looking for, uh, how, how targeted they are against you. Clearly, it's less common, uh, but it certainly does happen. The most of most of what you'll see, obviously, is the is the uh, automated attack. OK, great. Um, can malware steal user user password and second token authentication information for 2FA um, and be successful connecting from another geolocation? Yeah, you bet. There every day there are, I'm sad to say. Uh, and I, I should have mentioned this earlier. There is no such thing as perfect security. You will never be 100% secure. What we're talking about in this talk is mitigating risk. And there's this spectrum uh, to reduce the risk as much as possible. But at the end, there's always going to be a little bit of risk. There are techniques getting used, uh, uh, vulnerabilities getting exploited every day with, with new fixes that come in and patch those and new vulnerabilities and new fixes. But sometimes uh, the bad actors come up with ways to set up a new cool, uh, unique web page that takes advantage of a new vulnerability that will ask you for your 2FA token and then they'll run around and input it over here on the real web, real web page, and they'll still get in if you enter your 2FA token with their splash page, with their fake login website. It's not nearly as common. It is far more complex for them to set up, but that has happened before, and it probably will happen again. So 2FA isn't perfect, <clears throat> but these flaws are usually uh, uh, dealt with as quickly as possible. Uh, and you will still be vastly more secure if you use uh, the techniques I'm talking about. Great, thank you. Uh, Microsoft recommends blocking legacy authentication. What are the best ways to find out who is using it and how to block it? I'm not sure what you mean by legacy authentication. Or so taking them to mean like, um, you know, uh, basic auth or say old versions of ntlm or landman or oh, all okay. that kind of stuff so they right. know they know they know they should block it but how do they find out where it's being used and, and how do they go about blocking that uh boy that's a tricky one so if you're talking about a corporate environment obviously one of the most critical things that needs to happen is uh ongoing vulnerability scanning and patching um that's one way to find inappropriate configurations. If your concern is the website I'm going to, I think they're using junky antique algorithms in the background. Uh, you're really at their mercy if you want to keep using that account. And I've been in that boat where I worked with a financial institution that did not allow for a password greater than eight characters. <laughs> I'd send them email. When are you going to join you know, <laughs> this uh, new century? Uh, and they eventually did. There will be inappropriate implementation of all kinds of things 
all the time. There's very little you can do uh, other than if, if you see signs that is taking place, uh, reach out and say, I don't like this. I would rather go to a different company unless you can please start securing my data a little bit better. It, it, it's a it's a it's a tough one. Um, I, I'm really just going through all of the opinions I have in my head right now. That's why I'm a little slow because I have so many. Uh, but the long and short is it, it's a, the same as, hey, we're going to secure your account by sending you this SMS token. The same response. Hey, how about you do some modern security uh, two factor authentication instead of this antique version? It's really not that hard. It happens all the time. When are you going to catch up? Uh, please secure my data better. Send them an email is the, is the best thing I can recommend. And there are some services you can use. Uh, I'm not going to go into them here to uh, literally just cause a scan uh, of the security configuration for the uh, website you're using. So there are ways to go ahead and, and scan them and get a, a simple report back without you know, attacking them and trying to exploit vulnerabilities. It, it's a very simple security related scan to look at their uh, certificate configuration, et cetera. So I'd recommend that if you want to uh, take a first glance for what it's worth. It is super complicated. OK, yeah, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> one thing I'll add to that too with some of the products that I work on, I know like some of our products like Defender for Identity often monitor for um, those legacy protocols, legacy authentication, that sort of thing. And it's something they detect and alert on Azure Defender, that sort of thing too. So Sentinel, those things are worth looking at also if you're trying to solve that problem at the uh, corporate level. All right, with that, I think we're about out of time here, but um, I pasted the links that Andrew mentioned in his presentation already, so check those out. Um, also, if you're looking for the recording of this, I pasted the link for that, aka.ms slash security webinars. We will have that up there as soon as we can. All the other links that we've referenced are on, kind of on our landing page that just is a series of links to everything else, aka.ms slash security community. We've got a couple great webinars uh, coming up. Those are on November 2nd, we got Azure Security Center Enhance IoT Security and Visibility with Defender and Sentinel. On November 9th, we've got another, another Azure Security Center one that is a recap of the Ignite 2020 announcements. On November 10th, we've got an Azure Network Security um, continuation of our series getting started with um, Azure Distributed Denial of Service uh, Protection. So please be sure and check those out. And again, those are all on our landing page at aka.ms slash security webinars. Uh, I want to thank Andrew for a fascinating presentation. Not only is this great news for all of us how to take care of this ourselves, but this is also something you can take on and pass on to family and friends to help them if some of this information is new to them. I want to thank uh, those on the line also who helped answer questions. Most of all, I want to thank all of you for being part of our community and we hope to see you next time. Thanks for joining everybody. <laughs>